I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, the search for answers in the devastating bridge collapse. As the mission now turns to search and recovery, local and federal authorities are investigating how this could happen. Former President Donald Trump is selling a new book. I'm proud to endorse and encourage you to get this Bible. We must make America pray again. Analysis and why Catholics should be weary. Honoring a legacy. We're going to challenge you to be greater, to be more holy. We remember the worldwide impact of Mother Angelica on the anniversary of her death. And Holy Week at the Vatican, a preview of the Pope's schedule. These stories add more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us. Our top story tonight, the Biden administration warns it is going to be a long road to recovery after the shocking collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore and getting the bridge rebuilt and the port back open will not be simple. The collapse is causing long-term pain, including the loss of six lives. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, one day after the bridge struck by that container ship plunged into the Patapsco River, the Biden administration tonight is tasked with finding out what went wrong, who's to blame, and most critically, getting the bridge rebuilt and that port reopened. A surreal scene in the port of Baltimore, the colossal collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge, diverting shipping and trucking around one of the busiest ports on America's east coast. In the White House press briefing room today, Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg warning it will be a big, long, and not inexpensive road to recovery. We still don't fully know the condition of the portions of the bridge that are still standing or of infrastructure that is below the surface of the water. So rebuilding will not be quick or easy or cheap, but we will get it done. Ship traffic entering and leaving the port of Baltimore suspended indefinitely. Analysts say that will force vessels or their cargo to be rerouted, potentially creating delays for importers and raising costs. We are concerned about the local economic impact with some 8,000 jobs directly associated with port activities. And we are concerned about implications that will ripple out beyond the immediate region. The National Transportation Safety Board says officials boarded the ship Tuesday and downloaded the Voyage data recorder. Investigators looking into the timeline of events. Also in the briefing room today, the Deputy Commandant for Operations for the U.S. Coast Guard. The Coast Guard highest priority now is restoring the waterway for shipping, stabilizing the motor vessel Dolly and removing it from the site, and coordinating a maritime casualty investigation under the leadership of the National Transportation and Safety Board. We're also learning more about the bridge collapse victims, including a married father of two. Menor Yasir Suazo Sandoval was originally from Honduras, but had been living in the U.S. for the last 18 years. Diplomats also report victims from Guatemala and Mexico. And I'm just proud of the way community has rallied together, especially on behalf of the folks who may have lost their lives and who were working for our betterment on that bridge. Also tonight, it's too early to tell or say when the port will be reopened and that bridge rebuilt. We do know that when the bridge was built back in the 1970s, it took five years to construct. Also, the ship is holding over one and a half million gallons of fuel with dozens of cargo containers containing hazardous materials. But the U.S. Coast Guard says those hazardous materials right now pose no threat to public safety. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Okay, thank you, Owen. After crews eventually remove the debris from the collapsed key bridge, the rebuilding process will start with the help of Congress. Our Capitol Hill correspondent, Eric Rosales, spoke with Maryland Senator Ben Cardin about his support for the process. Well, I think we recognize that's the strength of our nation. When a community is impacted like this, we all come together to help. President Biden's been very clear about his commitment to help Baltimore. I've gotten calls from my colleagues that are interested in helping. Uh, we'll get the help we need. Uh, engineers estimate that the rebuilding of the Francis Scott Key Bridge could be at least $600 million, more than 10 times its original cost in the 1970s. Both House Speaker Mike Johnson and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer have promised congressional aid when Congress returns 
on April 8th. Well, on Capitol Hill, there is a feeling of unease among Republicans. Some say Speaker Mike Johnson is on shaky ground, especially after throwing his support behind a $1 trillion government funding bill last week. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has that report. Good evening, Tracy. The drums are definitely beating louder against House Speaker Mike Johnson. Some Republicans say that the Speaker has been caving in on all the Democrats' demands, and they're now calling on the new leader to take the gavel and stand firm. I can promise you, if you put a Ukraine bill on the floor and you haven't secured the border, there's going to be a problem uh, within, the, within the ranks in, in, on Capitol Hill. So let's focus on doing our job. After more than half of House Republicans voted against the government funding bill, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene filed a resolution to remove Speaker Johnson. But some Republicans are concerned a vote on the floor for a new speaker could open the door for Democrats. Not right now, I wouldn't, because if it would elect Hakeem Jeffries, it would hand it over to the Democrats, and we, I just can't see us doing that. My vote would uh, most likely be for a Speaker Jeffries, which becomes an increasingly uh, likely reality day after day as Republicans uh, pursue further midterm resignations. Midterm resignations like Republican Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin, who is due to step down on April 19th, shortly after Congress returns from Easter recess, leaving House Republicans with only a one vote majority. I am not going to be responsible for Hakeem Jeffries being Speaker of the House. I am not going to be responsible for a Democrat majority taking over our Republican majority. That lies squarely squarely on the shoulders of these Republicans that are leaving early. There's a lot of discontent happening. And when I saw and heard there was going to be possibly another motion to vacate, I said, here we go again. The dysfunctional Republican do-nothing Congress continues. This would further pr paralyze the Congress. GOP leadership says Republicans have to come together. It's tough with a five-seat majority. It's tough with a two-seat. Uh, one's going to be the same. We all have to work together. We all have to unite if we're going to get some things done. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has not yet announced when she might call for a vote on her motion. In a recent interview, former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who was ousted by the Freedom Caucus back in October, advised Speaker Johnson not to be afraid of a motion to vacate. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Now, President Biden is enlisting the help of some of his predecessors as he heads into the contentious 2024 election. The president will hold a massive fundraiser with former Presidents Obama and Clinton in New York tomorrow. Former President Obama has agreed to several campaign appearances before November. This comes following a meeting between Obama and Biden at the White House on Friday, where the two discuss the 14th anniversary of the Affordable Care Act. The former President Donald Trump is partnering with country music singer Lee Greenwood to promote the God Bless the USA Bible. The Bible retails for $59.99 and includes a copy of the U.S. Constitution, Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, Pledge of Allegiance, and a handwritten chorus from Greenwood's hit from which the Bible is named. The website promoting the Bible clarifies that none of the proceeds will go to Trump's 2024 campaign. However, it does not mention legal fees. And here now with a Catholic perspective on the God Bless the USA Bible is Dr. Matthew Bunsen, Vice President and Editorial Director for EWTN News. Matthew, always so good to see you. Um, so what more can you tell us about this Bible? Well, as you note, uh, it uh, incorporates a number of elements uh, from our founding documents of the country. That was something that was very important, apparently, to uh, President Trump, former President Trump, now candidate Donald Trump. Uh, it also relies on the translation of the scripture of the King James Version of the Bible, and that's something that uh, we need to talk more about in a second. But uh, that translation uh, is uh, at the heart of this Bible. Uh, this is a Bible, I think, that is really intended very much and, and will have appeal uh, to much of President, uh, former President Trump's base. And what I mean by that is that uh, his supporters uh, will appreciate this Bible very much. He is also, I think, tapping into what is a wider concern in the United States for a decline in religiosity, a decline, as he puts it, in prayer. Uh, it's captured all, I think, by the phrase that he uses in his social media blast today, uh, that uh, he wants to make America pray again. Uh, his critics, and we know that there are very many of them, are already uh, criticizing him uh, for this Bible, arguing that it uh, is at risk of conflating church and state, 
Uh, I expect also that uh, in the criticisms we'll see that phrase that we're already seeing quite a bit of, and that's Christian nationalism. Yeah, and Matthew, how should Catholics approach this? Yeah, well, I, I mentioned that this is the, the King James Version of Scripture. Uh, it's important to stress that because the, the King James Version was published, I believe, in 1611 and was sort of the official translation for the Church of England. Uh, it is a Protestant Bible, meaning that it uh, is omitting or has removed uh, many of the books that we would find in an approved Catholic Bible. And Matthew, really quickly before I let you go, what recommendations do you have? Yeah, well, I think it's important for Catholics uh, to encourage the reading and study of Scripture. Uh, that is something for all of us to do. And if we're going to study and meditate on Scripture, for, especially for private study, you want to use an approved translation. In the U.S., uh, the one, if you go to the, the site of USCCB, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the one that they approve especially is the uh, New American Bible, a uh, revised edition. Uh, but you can also find, uh, for example, the, the revised standard version, a Catholic edition, which is a very fine translation. And if you're looking to buy a Bible, Bible, I would encourage everyone seriously to go to Religious Catalog at the EWTN.com site, where we have a wide variety of beautiful Bibles and, more importantly, study Bibles. We need to know our faith and we need to know our Scripture, but we need to be reading the right texts of Scripture, the right translations, and they need to be Catholic ones. Yeah, so important, very important. Dr. Bunsen, thank you so much for being with us and sorting this all out. We really appreciate it. God bless. Yeah, great to be with you. Blessed Holy Week. For a second time, a U.S. appeals court ruled against Texas in its dispute with the federal government. It is the latest development in this back-and-forth legal case. The law would allow Texas authorities to arrest those who cross the U.S. southern border illegally. The Justice Department says the law is a clear violation of federal authority, while Texas says the White House has not done enough to stop the chaos at the border. The law was in effect for just a few hours after the Supreme Court allowed it. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals put the law on hold where it now remains for the time being. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly. We remember our beloved foundress, Mother Angelica, on the anniversary of her death. Plus, why millions of the faithful join celebrities like Mark Wahlberg in this Lenten challenge each year. Welcome back. Today marks the eighth anniversary of the death of our foundress, Mother Angelica, a poor Claire nun who changed the world through television, bringing the word of God to millions of homes. Jesus is the solution. The Eucharist is the solution. Mary is the solution. What a mother. And what a mother she was to all of us here at EWTN and to those who tuned in. Mother Angelica launched EWTN on the air back in 1981 as the country's first Catholic satellite television station. Today, EWTN is the largest Catholic media corporation in the world. And we hope you'll join us in offering a prayer for Mother on this very special day. Well, as Lent draws to a close, so does the largest prayer challenge in the world, world Hallow's Pray 40. This year's meditation focused on surrendering life to God with the book, He Leadeth Me, by Father Walter Chizak, a Jesuit priest in prison more than 20 years ago in the Soviet Union. Walking alongside participants were a number of well-known Catholics, including Father Mike Schmitz, Mark Wahlberg, and Jonathan Rumi. Joining us now for an update on the challenge is co-founder and CEO of the Hello app, Alex Jones. Alex, great to have you back on. Um, so this year marks the third annual Pray 40 Challenge. Um, for those who may not be familiar, tell us more about it and what inspired you to do this. Yeah, it's our biggest content challenge, content release that we do every year. And this year has been absolutely massive, more than double any other piece of content or challenge that we've done. And the idea is that we all journey through a series of prayers and meditations together. Um, and the season of Lent is the biggest one we have every year. There's just something special about Ash Wednesday and using Lent as an opportunity to commit to growing deeper in a daily habit of prayer. And this year we went through the book, He Leadeth Me, and had some incredible personal testimonies and um, challenges and fasting challenges. And it was just a blessing to see so many millions of people building daily habits of prayer throughout Lent. Yeah, it really is an incredible and beautiful thing. 
Tell us how it's grown through the years uh, from since the inception until now, and how many people are taking part this year? Yeah, we've we've only been around for four or five years or so, and it started, you know, with a cup. We built it just for me, so originally it was just me using it, and then, you know, a couple friends and family used it, and then, you know, shortly uh, a couple thousand people were using it, and then a couple tens of thousands of people using it, and now millions of people. I think we are at 18 and a half million downloads or something. 1.7, 1.8 million folks have joined the Lenten Pray 40 Challenge this year, which last year was around half a million. So it was just a massive growth. The really exciting part for us is we have way more people this year, even on a relative basis, committing to and sticking with a daily habit of prayer throughout Lent and hopefully into the Easter season. So it's been awesome for us to see the community come together and really commit to prayer. Yeah, that's so wonderful. What's your favorite part of it? Well, it changes about every week. Um, Sister Bernice um, is a missionary of charity who we had as a part of the Lenten challenge, and she was just incredible, just this beautiful woman of deep love. Um, Sister Miriam does these beautiful imaginative prayers. Father Mike's obviously incredible. Mark Wahlberg does these great fasting challenges. Um, and Matt Marr actually just recorded a, an exclusive song on He Leadeth Me, on this theme of surrender. And so I just listened to that this morning. So that's probably my favorite thing uh, uh, right now. But it, it, it changes pretty much every week as we add some new stuff to it. Yeah, and we talked about the numbers and how it's grown, so many more people participating. Why do you think uh, participation has been so high and has grown so much? Yeah, I think there's this hunger both for people who take their faith really seriously. We've seen a bunch of bishops and monks and people who are doing holy hours and daily mass on the app and a desire to grow deeper in spirituality and real contemplative and meditative life. But it has a similar appeal to folks who have fallen away from their faith, people who you know, haven't been to church in 30 years, people who haven't prayed in decades. And this, this appeal of spirituality and really the offer that Christ brings us of real peace, peace that, you know, the world can't really touch. And in today's world of division and anxiety and stress and social media, just the offer that Christ gives of real lasting deep peace, I think we've seen it change countless people's lives. And it's a blessing to get to watch God work in people's lives. And we're hopeful for what it'll do for the world. Absolutely. An incredible blessing indeed. Thank you, Alex, so much for being here with us today. We appreciate it. And for all that you do, God bless you. Thank you for having me. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, patience is a virtue. Pope Francis reminds the faithful to slow down in a world of instant gratification. That and a twist on an old tale, how a secular symbol is teaching children a sacred story. Pope Francis calls on the faithful to imitate Christ's patience. Non siamo capaci di stare pazienti. At the weekly talk, the Holy Father explained that if Christ is patient, then every Christian is called to be patient, recalling that a Christian full of patience offers a very powerful testimony of Christ's love. The Holy Father encouraged the faithful to cultivate the virtue by observing the patience of those who suffer and by contemplating that of the crucified one. Well, in just a few hours, the traditional Easter celebrations at the Vatican will kick off. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Tonhauser gives us a preview of what to expect. Pope Francis is now preparing to preside over seven Easter celebrations spanning four days. Although all celebrations are currently confirmed, adjustments may be made to relieve the Pope of some duties who has still not fully recovered from his bronchitis. How many people fail to approach us or keep at a distance because in the church they feel unwelcomed and unloved, regarded with suspicion and judged? In God's name, let us be welcoming and forgiving, always. On the morning of Holy Thursday, the Pope will preside over the Chrism Mass in St. Peter's Basilica. Later in the afternoon, Pope Francis will make a private visit to Rome's penitentiary of Ribibia for women, where he will preside over Holy Mass. During his visit, the Pope will also meet with female inmates and staff of the facility. Pope Francis previously celebrated Mass in Rome's Ribibia prison on Holy Thursday back in 2015. Et introibit cum Jesu 
Good Friday is an a-liturgical day because the Holy Mass isn't celebrated. In the afternoon, the Pope is scheduled to preside over the solemn celebration of the Passion of the Lord in St. Peter's Basilica. Following this, in the evening, the Holy Father will preside over the Way of the Cross at the Colosseum. For this specific occasion, and for the first time, Pope Francis will prepare meditations to be read at the procession. This, then, is what the Pasch of the Lord accomplishes. It motivates us to move forward, to leave behind our sense of defeat, to roll away the stone of the tombs in which we often imprison our hope, and to look with confidence to the future, for Christ is risen and has changed the direction of history. Holy Saturday is a day of sorrow and sadness, marked by silence, mourning and reflection. Christians meditate on Jesus of Nazareth in the tomb and on his descent into hell, and await his resurrection with prayer and fasting. The Pope will preside over the Easter Vigil Mass in St. Peter's Basilica at 7.30 in the evening. On Easter Sunday, Pope Francis will preside over Holy Mass in St. Peter's Square. At noon, from the central lodger of St. Peter's Basilica, the Holy Father will give his Urbi et Orbi to the city and the world, message and blessing to the faithful in Rome and across the globe. Monday morning marks Easter Monday, often called Monday of the Angel, which commemorates the angel encounter with the women who came to Jesus' tomb. At noon, Pope Francis will lead a special Angelus, concluding his extensive program of Easter celebrations. In Rome, Andreas Townhauser, EWTN News Nightly. A commercialism and secularism this time of year can make it difficult for parents to teach their children about the sacredness of Holy Week and Easter. In an attempt to tackle that challenge, 16-time bestseller Anthony DiStefano wrote the story of the Easter Bunny and a story of a small bunny who seeks healing from Jesus for his sick mother and faithfully listens to our Savior's words and eventually goes on to share the message of salvation to all who will listen. And here now to tell us more about the book is the book's author, Anthony DiStefano. Anthony, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. So tell us more about the book, the inspiration behind it, and why you decided to write it. Well, you know, I wrote this book because I was so tired of that silly secular Easter bunny hopping in and taking center stage on this most holy Christian day of the year. You know, we have to be very careful of secular symbols. Parents can't be blind to the fact that there is an ongoing culture war in our society, and our deepest beliefs are under constant and relentless attack. And uh, the other side doesn't hesitate to try to jump over the heads of parents and propagandize children with their woke anti-Christian agenda. So we have to make sure as Catholics that, uh, that, that when it comes to these holy days, we keep the true meaning of these holy days front and center of any catechesis for children. I wrote my book because I thought there was a way to adopt the Easter Bunny for a truly religious purpose. Yeah, and tell us how you were able to do that. You know, take this secular symbol and give it a sacred meaning. Well, in my book, what I simply do is I take the main character of the Easter Bunny and I, and I place him in biblical times 2,000 years ago in Palestine. And it so happens that this little bunny has a, a sick mother who he lives with. She's very sick, can't even get out of bed. And when this bunny hears about this amazing man who can heal with the touch of his hand, Jesus, he gets the idea into his head that he might be able to ask Jesus to cure his mom. And being a good son, he immediately sets out on a journey to find Jesus. And in the process, he actually witnesses the main events of the Passion Week. He sees the Last Supper. He sees the crucifixion. He even sees the resurrection. I love this so much. What's the big takeaway here? What do you think for parents? Uh, I think the big takeaway is the, is the true meaning of, 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 of Easter, you know, which is the central Christian message of hope and life after death. The fact that death isn't the end of the story. The end of the story is resurrection and life everlasting in heaven. God can pull good out of the worst evil. That's the message that all of us need to hear over and over. And it's a message that kids need to hear very, very early because no matter how much we try to shield and protect them, there's just no way to prevent them from experiencing suffering and from grieving over people and even pets in their lives who die. 
that when that happens, they have to be able to grieve in a healthy Christian way. And ultimately, uh, that's the difference between believers and non-believers. Believers don't suffer and grieve any less than non-believers, but we do suffer and grieve with hope. We, we don't despair. And that belief in the resurrection in heaven is a gift we can give children that will help them have hope over the whole course of their lives. And it's a seed that I, that I hope to have planted in this book and in all the children's books I've written. Anthony, I am so happy that you wrote this book. This really is a gift to all of us. Before I let you go really quickly, where can parents find this book? Uh, proverbially, where all books are sold, uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon.com, EWTN, gift store, of course. And I always encourage uh, parents to make use of our Catholic bookstores out there and Christian bookstores. All right, we're going to leave right there. Anthony, thank you so much for coming on and telling us all about this wonderful book. We appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you. You too. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.